Um, next concept to introduce then is that now that we're hopefully pretty well grounded in storage temporality, the next concept to, uh, uh, you know, to kind of to introduce is the idea of query temporality. So we have storage temporality and query temporality is kind of two different concepts. And one of the things, so think about if you have a non-temporal query, the result that you're getting back would just be that single value for the customer's credit rating that you wanted to get at, right? But what's interesting is, is that you could get that result back that you're looking for. You could accomplish that query by going against non-temporal storage, by going against valid temporal storage, okay, or by going against bitemporal storage. So any one of those storage types can, can support a non-temporal query, okay? For bitemporal queries, which you want to get back the full richness that we saw in that matrix, you can only get that richness of information returned to you if you have bitemporal storage, okay? And so then what, the, uh, what these lines are showing then is, is the solid lines are, are kind of showing for these, these query temporalities what their native storage type is. And the dotted lines are showing which, uh, which uh, query types are able to be, uh, be serviced by the different storage types, even if they're not their of their native temporality. And so why is this important? It's important because queries which are done against your native uh, storage type are going are to perform better, and they're going to be the simplest queries to write, the most straightforward. They're going to give you the, just the amount of complexity that you need in order to do that. Make sense? So now we have the idea of, uh, of query temporality. The next concept to get to is the idea of uh, different types of queries that you may want to do, okay? So not uh, uh, query temporality, but these are the nine core query types, which can, each can be assigned to one of the four types of query temporality. And what this is based on, and again, going back to our matrices, why I needed to lay that conceptual groundwork there, is these are all based upon the different types of inputs that you would put into going against those uh, storage of the different temporalities. So the first query type is a non-temporal query, and you would just have no input parameters, right? Because it doesn't make any sense to put in any input parameters of valid date time or transaction date time against non-temporal storage, right? So that's what that simple query type looks like. You don't need to put in any input parameters. The, uh, the next query type is uh, a valid temporal query where we only put in a single valid timestamp. Right? So, so think of putting in a single valid timestamp against a valid temporal store. That's what the, uh, the type 2 query is. Type 3 is where you would put in a range of valid values that you wanted to get data from. Right? So you're seeing the, you know, the range across valid times. Type 4 is, a, is uh, going against transaction temporal storage where you put in a single transaction timestamp. 5 is a very interesting uh, type of query as we'll see in, in, a, in a minute when we see the footprint of that query. This is where um, we are putting in a, a transaction timestamp range, okay? And so we're saying, I want to see the data for a, uh, I'm going against transaction temporal data, and I want to see the results for a range of values. The next four are bitemporal queries, and again, you know, the same permutations. You can have a discrete valid timestamp and a discrete transaction timestamp, or you can have one discrete and the other a range, and vice versa, or you can have them both being ranges, okay? So these are the nine basic temporal query types that we can have. Back to our, uh, to our graphic, right? So this is just kind of tying it in here. So here you see the nine query types uh, and, how they're, and their relationship to the four types of query temporality. And then what you see here is we go back to that, uh, that matrix which I had. And so here's the matrix and here's showing the footprint of each of these nine different query types going against that bitemporal matrix or that matrix that we populated with bitemporal data in response to those five different events. Okay? So I can, you know, go through them again simply. Are you guys pretty comfortable? All right, so again, the first query type is transaction, I'm sorry, is non-temporal, so it's just a single value where the transaction, so, and, and so I guess here's the major point to get here is that, you know, as I said, all of the different query types can be accomplished against bitemporal data, right? So here you have the richness of bitemporal data, and then this is showing how you would accomplish all, those, not all of these query types, not going against their native temporality, but going against the bitemporal uh, level of, of richness, right? So to, get the, to, to mimic the non-temporal query going against bitemporal data, you do have to put in an input parameter of transaction time and valid time. 
what input parameter for transaction time and valid time do you put in? Now and now. Right? You say, I want the valid time of now and the transaction time of now. And you come back with the footprint of a query that looks like that. Other queries have the same footprint, but there's other criteria around how you determine what their valid time stamp is going to be or what their transaction time stamp is going to be, which is given as an input. So uh, two is a, where is two? Two is a, uh, a valid temporal query, right? We want to get back this single cell, okay? The transaction time would be now, but the valid time would be an input parameter, okay? Three is, a, is another valid temporal query. This time we're saying the transaction time is now, but the valid time is a range, okay? So this may be a little conceptual. I think you know, in a little bit we're going to kind of tie this to real world uh, you know, business cases of why this is so powerful and why this is doing things which is very hard for people to, uh, to do today. So I think you get the idea. I could go through each one or we're, we're good. Okay. Okay. So just to complete kind of this side of the, uh, the equation then, the next step that we get to is kind of API design, right? And so now if you have these nine different query types, what, you, what might you want to expose to people to support these nine different query types? And this is just introducing in the, the concept that you could have nine different APIs in order to support them. And then you have the complexity of having nine different APIs, right? Or, you know, but they would be very simple APIs. It would be very tailor-made to the purpose that they were being used for. Or you can have a limited number of APIs, and they can fulfill all the different query types, but they may be overly complex or, or, or expose more complexity that you need for these query types. So for example, you know, a, a by temp to, uh, um, to discrete timestamps type of query doesn't need to have all the complexity of the uh, need, needing to put in two ranges. Okay? So this is just you know, API strategy uh, you know, type of, uh, of illustration. Okay. So probably what you really want to get to here then is, is what are the physical storage options, right? We talked about conceptually, uh, you know, storage temporality. We talked about conceptual query temporality and about the different, uh, you know, API strategies. So for these types of temporality that we've been talking about, what are the physical options for, for implementing them that people may use? <coughs> 